Hello, everybody. Welcome to our virtual career day series with the Los Angeles Public Library. My name is Lynn Wynn, and I'm here with my co-host, Jessica Levy from Palisades Branch. So you'll see Jessica wave over there. We're so excited to have you here for our weekly virtual career day series where we introduce amazing careers to you. Uh, today, we have two amazing guest speakers from the music industry here to share some tips, tricks and provide you with some insight on how they got into their profession. Uh, we would like to extend our deepest thanks to all of our participants for being here with us today, our amazing guest speakers, uh, the Library Foundation, and of course, the Friends of the Library, uh, of, so the Chinatown Branch Library for their generous support. Before we begin, I would like to go over some housekeeping rules. Your microphones are already muted, so you and you don't need to have your videos turned on. Recording is in progress. If you wish to ask questions at any time during the program, you can type that into the chat box and we'll try to ask that question for you. Or you can wait till our Q&A and you can ask our questions uh, to, with our guest speakers. We're all here to help, so please don't be shy. All right, we hope that you enjoy today's career day. Please remember to complete one very short survey at the end of the program. So with that being said, I'd like you all to open up your chat box. The popcorn question that I would like to ask all of you is, who is your favorite artist or musician? That way we'll get a feel of, you know, what kind of group we have here today. Oh, we have BTS. <laughs> all right. Oh, wow. Jonah, <laughs> we do love Jonah. Oh, I love Vampire Weekend. Okay, so you guys, uh, you know, so we, you know, my two amazing friends here, we have Sleep, and we have Jonah Levine, Sleep Dees and Jonah Levine here. Um, they are both very, very, very well known in the music industry. <laughs> and um, lots of amazing, I like Jackie Chan. <laughs> Somebody wrote Jackie Chan. <laughs> All right, so David Bowie, wow, that's a really good one. So you know what, uh, while everybody is typing up their responses, I'm gonna go ahead and start this uh, interview with Sleep. Sleep here. <laughs> So Sleep here is uh, an American producer, songwriter, and record executive from Los Angeles. Sleep, forget, Sleep began producing uh, in 2005, and his production credits include working with BTS, The Black Eyed Peas, Rihanna, Usher, Eric Bellinger, <laughs> Gucci Mane, Jake Paul, Gig, Cyberpunk 2077, Coca-Cola, and many, many more. So welcome, Sleep. Oh, the whole bio. Okay. <laughs> we have <laughs> such an active group here. So sleep up, uh, please tell us your name and what is, uh, you know, what's your profession? What does your job entail? I love the setup you have behind you. Oh uh, yeah, this is my uh, work from home space. Uh, my name is Sleep, I'm a music producer, songwriter. Um, I forgot the rest of your question already. Uh, that's yeah. That's, that's it. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I work on music. Um, you know, my job just pretty much entails just taking the vision that an artist has for their record and bringing it to real life. So. Amazing. When did you realize that music was your calling? Uh, I would say I was probably seven or eight years old I think uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't know it at the time like how to just identify it but I will remember like listening to music with my friends and I would just point out parts and songs that they wouldn't hear and I would say like oh I love this part over here it's kind of like in your left ear on the headphones and they were like oh I didn't notice that and I started to notice that I heard music differently from uh, all my other friends and it just kind of grew from there just always been interested in music. That's amazing. So what um, led you down this career path? Like, how did it inspire you to actually take, take control of it and make it into your career? Um, I honestly, I never knew that it was, it was possible. Uh, I think in high school, like I, I begged my mom to buy me this, this keyboard and I know that we, we couldn't afford it, but somehow she made it happen. And, um, I just started learning how to play songs and I would play songs all the time that I would hear on the radio. And then uh, around college time, I wanted to actually do uh, film at the time. And I was actually working on music video sets on and off because my dad had a, a close friend um, 
Her name is uh, Senna Henry. She's actually now the uh, she was the creator of Empire, the TV show. But she became a, a pretty big movie director and things like that. But at the time, she was directing music videos, and she let me come on set and like she started putting me in music videos when I was like 16. I would come down to to LA for the summertime. And that was like my first taste of just seeing like everything happen, how it happens behind the scenes. And so I wanted to do a uh, film at first. And I remember like the night, like I went to go like buy, uh, <laughs> I went to buy this program from this guy. It was actually like pirated software. Don't do that kids. But um, I went to go buy this movie software from this guy and I went to his house and it was raining and I had actually uh, injured myself. So I was on crutches at the time. And I come in this guy's house, I think I'm like 19 at the time. And when I went to, to leave, my crutch slipped and I knocked over his bookshelf. Like it was a disaster actually. And, <laughs> and he helped me up. And after he helped me up, he just asked me, he said, hey bro, do you like music too? And I was just like, I just destroyed your living room. You're asking me, do I like music? And so he gave me uh, a CD of a program called Reason. And I went home that night and I was like, I'm going to just learn the film stuff tomorrow. I'm going to, I bought a book and everything. I'm going to learn how to do this. So when I go back to see my dad's friend, I can say like, hey, I can, I can edit video now or whatever. And I went home and I put the music program in first and I never ever installed the movie program. Like from that day on, it was just music. I was just addicted from that point on. And that was how I like started down the path of like trying to figure out how to turn my love for like making beats into a career, I guess. Cause I hadn't seen anybody or met anybody that had done it before. So I didn't know that it was, that, I, that it could be a real thing, so yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> what were some of the things that, like, what were some of the, the, the next steps that you did after discovering, uh, you know, this software program about, you know, creating music? What were some of the next steps that you did to, um, you know, get deeper into this profession? Um, <laughs> so there was a, a, a airline, I think it was called Air, AirTran, and they had a thing called Xfair, and it was, if you're if you're between the age of 18 and 22 or 18 and 23, you can fly anywhere standby in the U.S. for $99 at the time. So this is like maybe 2005, 2006, and I started printing up these CDs with my beats on them, and I would just buy a plane ticket. And I was working in real estate at the time. I was doing like mortgage processing, so like. My mornings would be busy, but and then the end of my day would be busy. But in the meantime, I had so much free time. So I would be on MySpace just trying to meet whoever I can meet. And I would just buy flights to places. Like I bought flights to Atlanta, to Charlotte, to Houston. And I would go with a backpack full of CDs and I would go to barbershops, barbecue places, any place I thought rappers would go to, I would go there and just drop off as many CDs as I can. And then, um, Eventually, this this woman uh, named Regina Davenport, she called me and uh, I, I, they asked if I can come meet in Atlanta and she was asking like, how old was I and things like that. And I was like, oh yeah, I can come tomorrow. And she's like, well, you live in California. And I'm like, I think I was like maybe about 21, 22 at the time. And um, I was like, no, no problem, I can come. And so she told me like, hey, if you make it, you make it. If you don't, then maybe we can just fly you out in like three weeks. And the next day I got on a flight and went to Atlanta. And uh, that led to me living in Atlanta for almost a year. And I worked on the Idlewild soundtrack, Outcast, like just different things like that. Um, I think that was like the first thing that I ever got paid for. Um, like really pay for it. And I was just like, oh, okay, yeah, this, this could work. <laughs> what are some of your um, career highlights? And what are some of the challenges and rewards from working in this type of industry? Um, I think career highlights wise, uh, I mean, this past year working with BTS, obviously that's a huge one. Um, but overall, when I look at when I look at just my discography and the different projects and the different things that I've worked on, um, I think the highlight is just like the diversity 
of everything that I've worked on. I've never been stuck on like, I have to work on, you know, Rihanna's album or I have to work on this American project. Um, I've been all over the world working on music. I actually have like, I think I have like the best selling song in the history of New Zealand or something, something crazy like that. Um, yeah, so I, I think that those are the highlights. It's just being able to take something that I love doing and and see the whole world from it. And then also just to, to make music with so many different people, you know. Um, the challenges, <laughs> uh, the music business is very, is very, it's a very competitive business. It's also um, a, bit, a bit clickish. And I think that those are some of the challenges. And then also like, like there's, you know, the areas where you're trying to like create the best art you can make over the integrity of the project that you might be working on, you know, cause as a producer, you might make a track at home. I might make a track here at home. And then, you know, my manager or whoever sells it to an artist and then I get the song back. And it's not necessarily always about not liking the song that comes back, but sometimes even the subject matter of the song that comes back, you know, like, what is this? Like, I didn't envision that for it. And uh, yeah, those are some of the challenges, but I mean, other than that, it's a, it's a pretty fun, uh, fun business to be in. <laughs> Did you um, attend any type of school or training to hone in on your skills of music producing? No, um, everything was self-taught and I am not anti-school, um, obviously, but I think that, uh, for, oh, what's up, Austin? <laughs> um, I, I, I do think that if you want to work in the music business as a creative, especially, especially as a creative, everything that you need is on the internet. Um, like I wish YouTube was around when I started because it would make things so much easier. Like even now, if there's like a new technique or something that I wanna know how to do, I just jump on YouTube and figure it out. Uh, it's, there's so much information. There's so much, so much information, so many tools. But uh, I do want to say this, that um, what I do is only one of many jobs in the music business. So if you love making music, you don't have to necessarily be a creative talent. Like there's so many jobs, like there's whole floors for lawyers. Um, there's a and who work on the creative side, but they don't actually make the music. There are plenty of positions in the music business. If you love music and you're passionate about it, don't think that you have to be a singer or an entertainer to do it and actually like make a living and have a nice life from, from doing it. You know, it's very possible to do one of many things in the music business. That's amazing advice. Um, does your, did you ever work for an, an organization where you interned? I, I remember you, you just said that uh, somebody offered you a job and then from that, from that point on, did you just go on to jump on, on like taking any opportunities that came at you with different projects? And um, if there's I've like, been, sorry, oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. I was saying like, you know, for, for teens out there, if there are internship opportunities, like I think with you, you're, you, you went out there, you were putting out your CDs in people's hands, getting them to listen to your music. Yeah. But for anybody out there that may be a little more shy and, or may not have the means to like, go out there and hop on a plane, especially in the middle of this pandemic. Like, what are some tips that you can offer to them um, that that they can probably do right now? I would say um, interning is great. Like, interning is great. And, and one thing about interning, too, is just like, what what value can you bring to a person as well? Like, I think that you have to think of, of that as well. Like, for me, um, I'm fairly good at like organizing things, but it can get really overwhelming. And um, that is kind of like how me and Danny, we, we met through me working with BTS, but then eventually like she's the most organized person 
in the world. Like, I mean, she has label guns, like <laughs> she, she's ridiculously organized, right? And I'm not, you know, and I don't always have time to be. So I would say like, if you're looking to, to intern, you know, bring some value to, to the table because your internship will turn into a job. Uh, I've gotten three of my interns full-time jobs. Um, and one of my friends, he's like, now he's like the, one of the head engineers, he's a, he's a recording engineer. And I think that last time I talked to him, he was at Universal, working at the Universal Studios. And so I remember he had just, you know, I met him, he was fresh off the plane from Tennessee and he brought a lot of value. You know, he's very quiet and very, you know, almost shy, but he was always on time. He always did his job and, and he never complained. And, you know, those kind of things like really help and definitely finding like people who are willing to mentor you because there's a lot of people like me that, are willing to give advice and and um, share and like one thing I deal with my interns all the time is uh, every Wednesday I would sit down with them for an hour or two and just go over any questions that they had for what they wanted to do in the music business because one wanted to engineer one wanted to produce and one wanted to work in business and I would just sit down with them for an hour or two every week and just that would be what I would give back to them for them helping me you know so. That's amazing. Do you have any resources that you can offer to our audience today that may be interested in going into this profession? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, if there's any aspiring music producers in here, uh, I can give you guys, you know, some sounds, some professional drums. Uh, you know, I've been collecting sounds and stuff for almost 15 years now, 16 years. So I can uh, definitely do that. Yeah. Cool. And is there um, any type of websites or um, software programs that you use on a daily basis that you really enjoy? Yeah, I use I use Ableton to do uh, my production in, um, and I, I do do some recording in Pro Tools because it's a little bit easier. But Ableton is like my go-to. Uh, has been for like the last seven or eight years. Yep. Awesome. And, you know, now that we're in the middle of this pandemic that began back in um, March, it, how has the pandemic affected your job? Um, it's been it's been pretty crazy, actually. Um, I don't think I've worked with anybody in person um, since March, I think. Uh, I, there's a couple people that I work with, but like they're my neighbors, like two people, like the guy who lives next door to me, he actually is Doja Cat's producer. And then um, my friend across the way, he's my really close friend. We work together a lot. He, he writes a lot of records with Cardi B. And so like, this is like my little bubble containment thing, but uh, it's changed a lot. Like this is the longest in 12 years that I've gone without being on an airplane. Um, Cause I do like a lot of international projects um you know using using zoom to do sessions and trying to figure out ways to just stay creative uh it's it's very different some like there were months where it was just very hard to like get inspired to to do it because i think a big part of like what i do is like i go out i meet people i hear other people's stories and i take bits and pieces of those and turn those into songs all the time and so just kind of being stuck in the house with my own thoughts. Like I was like a little uninspired <laughs> at times to work, but um, yeah, it kind of, you know, just made it through and, and, and it's a new year. So I'm trying to just still get adjusted to working uh, in this capacity because it's so much different than how it was before. There was always a component of working from home, but then you go to a larger studio and you're with the artists and you're playing music loud and you're having fun. And like, I, I miss that. I miss that a lot. So. Mm. Are you, um, what are some things that you're doing for self-care while you're at home now? I created, I wish I could show you guys. I'll show you guys next time. I created a whole um, gym in the front of our house. Uh, I am now a, a, a plant dad. I have, 11 plants now. They're all alive. They're green. <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, that and just like 
I don't know. I started taking like this online cooking class with Gordon Ramsay. I was just, I'm just trying to do anything that I can to just not have to just solely make music all day long without going crazy. But um, yeah, self-care part of it is very important. And, you know, just more, I was never really like a FaceTime person. I never really liked video chat, but I do now. <laughs> That's awesome. Are you um, able to share with us um, any projects that you're currently working on? Or talk about, <laughs> or or maybe just give us a tidbit <laughs> of anything. I want to. Um, I'm working on, on music for a really big film right now that's coming out this summer. I can't say anything else about it. Um, I'm trying to think of something that I can talk about because everything is always so top secret. Um, I did do music with Rosalia um, last year, uh, right before the pandemic. I don't know what's going to happen with that. Um, I did do a song with Adele. Uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen with that yet. Um, um, yeah, there's there's lots of stuff. There will be a lot of music out this year that I produced, for sure. That's awesome. We're definitely looking forward to listening to all of that. Um, I, I, would, I, you know, I want to ask you, you know, if you could turn back time, what is something mm -hmm. that you wish you could tell yourself? So like, let's save say your 18 year old self, save the money. <laughs> save the money and one day the money will save you. Um, I think, so I had a, a crazy, like, when everything kind of first took off for me, it was 2009. That was the the, the Black IP stuff. And uh, you know, my, my father passed away in 2010 and it was May. And then June, I got the biggest check that I've ever, I had ever seen in my life. And so like, uh, I deal with any other, you know, 23, 24 year old would do to, to cope and deal with that at the time, I just, Bit way too much money. I wish I would have, you know, saved it, but it worked out. Um, and I also probably would have told myself to. Um, I feel like I did a lot of things, you know, as as correct as I could, but I think that I would have definitely focused on uh, probably doing more for myself. I think as a producer, you can get so caught up in everybody else's vision and everybody else's dream. Because what I do is like, you know, I'm, I'm supplying, you know, a canvas for, for, for people. And I think that um, if I could go back, I wouldn't have wasted my time with certain people that I felt were ungrateful, you know, and things like that. Uh, yeah, but I'm pretty happy with, <laughs> with how everything turned out. So. That's great, uh, great advice. Do you have any last words for um, our teens or audience members out there that uh, want to pursue a career similar to yours? Uh, yeah, I would just say start start now, like start now. Like if you want to be an a and &R, what a and &R does is they kind of help coordinate projects. So they find beats for the artists, they help set up studio time, they set up collaborations, different things like that that they help with. If, you feel like you have an ear for music, you know, start now, you know, and I would also say, um, don't get so caught up in wanting to reach like a certain executive or whatever. Uh, the people that you build with now, like in your age group or your, your level where you're coming in at, five years from now, six years from now, those are gonna be the people that are making decisions, you know? So when I first started, um, you know, 2007, 2008, my friends that I met then are doing amazing things now as well. Um, one of my friends, he's, you know, the vice president of Def Jam and another friend, he's the a and at uh, RCA. He's the one who signed uh, SZA and, and Bryson Tiller and, you know, they're doing, and, and her, they're doing amazing things with R&B. And so, um, my whole circle of friends that I met when we're trying to like come up and hustle together, those are the people I reach out to now when I say, hey, I want to work on, you know, 
that project or this project, like we all still are in some kind of contact with one another. And I would say just come up with your with your peers because those are gonna be the people that make decisions. The people that you might want to reach now, they're already rich and they're not hustling, they're not, you know, they're not trying to develop someone that's starting out. You know, just start with people like around your group and come up together. That's great. Thank you so much, Lee, for providing us so much insight into your, your job and this profession and your life. It's, it's been so amazing <laughs> learning so much about you. So, um, you know, there's definitely going to be Q&A at the very end with sleep. So definitely stick around. I'm going to turn it over to Jessica now to interview Jonah. Thank you. Thank you for that. That was really incredible to hear your story, Sleep. Well, I'm happy to introduce our next guest. Uh, Jonah Levine is a trombonist, pianist, composer, and arranger from Berkeley. He currently lives in Los Angeles. He has performed at leading jazz festivals around the world, including the Montreux Jazz Festival in Switzerland and the Monterey Jazz Fest in California, the West Philippine Sea Jazz and Blues Festival, and venues throughout Europe, Mexico, India, and South America. Where haven't you been? <laughs> um, so welcome, Jonah. And if you can just uh, tell us what what do you consider your profession to be if you have to put a label on it? Sure, yeah. I'm Jonah Levine and uh, I'm a musician. Um, you know, that's the simplest answer. I do a lot of things, uh, play a lot of instruments, uh, wear a lot of hats, but that's the simplest way to <laughs> put it is I'm a musician. So. So currently, do you have any specific jobs or projects? Um, that's the thing is that like um, what I do um, changes pretty much any any given moment. I mean, um, you know, um, as a so I'll say I'm a multi instrumentalist, which means I play a few different instruments. But trombone is my primary instrument, if you guys know what that is. Um, and so. Um, you know, when I, if actually by the time I got to school and even in high school, the first time I ever got paid to do music, like the first money I ever made was in high school performing on trombone. And uh, for much of my career, that's been the primary source of income is literally playing the instrument trombone. Um, sometimes that's at a show with another artist. Sometimes that's at my show where I'm the band leader. And sometimes that's on an album. Sometimes it's with a producer like Sleep, for example. Um, uh, so that's that's one way. Um, but as I've sort of you know progressed in my career over the past few years, I've also sort of like sleep. Like I've been more interested in prioritizing my own projects as an artist and as a leader. Um, so production has been more of a priority for me lately. Um, so you know working at home in the studio and uh, being in control of the whole you know part of the song. Um, and that's been a beautiful thing for me because I've always been interested in composing. I've always been interested in playing lots of different instruments. And so production is a great way to kind of combine all the different things. Um, but, you know, even beyond that, I've, you know, over the past 10 years, I've, I've done teaching. I've done, um, like I said, recording, composing, arranging, um, even done notation where I'm like, you know, writing sheet music for people. I don't do that anymore. I don't like that. Um, so I've, I've, I've done a lot of things. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Right now, You're a musician. Yeah. I'm a musician. Right now, uh, no, nothing in particular. There's no one single job that um, is keeping me particularly busy. But lots of things that I'm working okay. on independently. Got it. And so let's go. Let's go back. Um, when did you first discover that music was something meaningful to you? Did you happen to grow up in a musical family? Tell us more. Um, sort of. You know, my pops was always you know, a musical kind of guy, like he had guitars and banjos or a banjo um, uh, lying around the house, you know, as a kid. Um, and he was always, you know, into music and, and loved it. So um, I think if you're around that as a kid, um, that's just gonna, you know, be part of you. You you are a sum of the people you spend the most time with uh, so, and especially your parents, right? So um, I think that definitely, um, you know, his interest and love for music uh, wore off on me. But I wouldn't say it was something I discovered. It was just something that has always been there. You know, there's stories I hear about me as a kid, even, you know, running around with my little, uh, what's that play? Uh, I forgot the company, but, um, you know, my little toy cassette tape and like bringing, yeah, you know, just like carrying that everywhere with me and like singing all the silly kid songs and stuff. Um, and then I remember like even like 
learning how to play the Rugrats theme song on piano at summer camp. You know, the older kid showed me how to do it. And so like, I always just had an affinity for music and uh, was always interested. So I, I wouldn't say I discovered it, it just kind of grew into itself. And I, and I always had the support and the privilege of like being able to, you know, um, pick up trombone in fourth grade because of the school I went to. And, you know, just being surrounded in such a musical uh, environment, just being in the Bay Area, you know, Berkeley, it's, you know, full of great musicians. So that mm -hmm. was, that was a big part of it too. And at what point then did you decide to take that interest in music and turn it into a career path? Um, well, kind of like I said, it, it was very gradual. Um, I would say like, so I started playing trombone in fourth grade and I had already uh, had some piano lessons before that. Um, and then when I got to middle school, I got really into like uh, rock and like punk and ska and reggae and stuff like that. Um, so I started teaching myself guitar. Um, but I was terrible at trombone. Cause let me tell you something, T trombone is like the hardest instrument to learn. Like it's not, I don't recommend anyone plays it. Like <laughs> if, unless they like love trombone, which is really weird. I've never met anyone that just loves trombone. I mean, maybe a couple of people, but, um, but I was terrible. I was horrible at trombone, but I just loved music so much. So I was teaching myself guitar and like, I was, you know, at the lunchroom, I would ask the music teacher like, oh, can you give me the keys so I could like play drums? You know what I mean? So I would just like play drums all day long at lunch. Um, and so the love was there. Um, and then, you know, I happened to meet Marty Wayner, who is just a local trombonist in the Bay Area. Um, but like the funkiest, most soulful, like sweetest, coolest dude. Um, and he plays trombone. And so he showed me that like, you can actually like do some really cool stuff on this instrument. Like I had no idea before that because I was just terrible. And, you know, I had to wake up early to play whole notes and count rests in the morning. And then all of a sudden this guy was showing me that you can play the blues, like you can play jazz, you can improvise on this instrument. Um, and so then when I got to high school, I, I just sort of fell in love with jazz and trombone and started taking it more seriously. And that's when I discovered like hip hop and um and world music and all, all sorts of stuff and uh I think the first time I got paid for music was probably freshman year I had a gig uh from someone who's still my friend I ended up going to college with him uh Ryan Thomas recommended me to play at someone's wedding celebration it wasn't even their wedding um and I got paid $75 to play trombone. And as a kid, I, I was like, what, yo, I'm getting paid $75 to, you know. So that was, you know, that feeling, like when you first get paid to play music, it's like, are you, it's almost like, how am I getting away with this? You know what I mean? It's like, it's like, this is just, like, this shouldn't be right. So, you know, I mean, I never like thought I was gonna be a professional musician. I just love music and I just, I started making money doing it as early as high school. So, and I just took it really seriously. So I just kept doing it. And then, I, you know, my peers were also going that direction. So a lot of them, you know, the high school I went to had a really strong legacy of specifically jazz musicians, um, guys that went off to make careers of themselves. Um, so, you know, it just became more and more of a realistic possibility. And, you know, I, I decided to go to UCLA uh, cause they had a good jazz program, but they also were like, like, great college just in general um so it gave me a chance to really like see like do I actually want to do this and by the time I graduated it was like I was already doing it you know so it, it was gradual you know I mm -hmm. never like woke up one morning and said this is it you know right so, and at UCLA did you what did you study there I studied uh ethnomusicology um which is the program that houses jazz um and it's one of the only schools in the world that offers that degree and i didn't even really know what it meant um i still don't really <laughs> i mean i know what it means kind of but um i i sort of just chose that because that was you know how i was able to study music and go to ucla at the same time um and you know it was you know more focused on academics uh than i would have liked you know um but going to school was was a great thing for me because um it gave me sort of a safety net you know um four years of of 
being able to have school as a priority where I could also, you know, use my free time to get into the industry and meet people in LA and sort of make a name for myself. So that by the time I graduated, I wasn't starting from scratch. It's like, I've already been here for four years. People already know who I am. Um, and I also met some great people. I had some great mentors at UCLA, you know, the legend, Kenny Burrell, uh, James Newton, uh, George Bohannon, Tamir Hendelman. Um, I had some great mentors. And, and the best thing I had was my peers, you know? I went to school with guys who, you know, you know, Sleep was talking about the importance of like, you know, having your circle and like, you know, being with your homies and like uh, being around people that um, are like-minded and, you know, you know, encourage you to do better and support you. And uh, I absolutely had that 100%. Uh, one of my friends, Phil, is in the chat right now. And, uh, you know, all, all my friends are, are doing amazing things. They're incredible producers, you know, composers, singers, songwriters, whatever. Um, so that was the best thing I got out of going to UCLA. So. And how did you transition from from being in that, you know, college environment to going out on your own? Did did you had you been working as a musician while simultaneously while you were pursuing your degree and then it just kind of carried over into postgraduate? But or how, how did you kind of take that make that leap and then expand upon your career? Absolutely. Basically, the way I went about it was um, when I decided I'm going to UCLA. I was like, okay, so yes, I'm going to go to school, but, but really like the second I enter Los Angeles, my goal is to be a musician, like be a professional musician. I basically pretended that like, I have four years to, to make a career in LA um, because, because I wanted to get to the point where when I graduate, I'm working enough to make a living um, because, you know, I knew better than to just go to school and then just expect to, I mean, you can't just show up somewhere, um, especially as a, as a instrumentalist, you know, uh, you can't just show up somewhere and just be really good at your instrument and expect to be making a full time living. You know what I mean? Just doing that. Um, it takes time. You have to know people. Networking is huge. You have to make a name for yourself. You have to get a reputation because people need to know who you are. And it's not like something where you can just apply for a job like you know i can't go on monster.com and be like i play trombone like no one cares like they call their friends you know so you get, you gotta get known so i had four years and th that was my attitude was like obviously school's important i'm not gonna just like ignore it but school and in my profession were sort of my two main priorities um there were you know unfortunately i skipped you know a fair amount of class you know what i mean just you know trying to balance which i don't recommend that's not a good thing kids <laughs> go to school, do your homework, um, eat your vegetables. But, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't the most ideal student, but I, but I always got it together. You know what I mean? Like any final I, I, I studied, I stayed up all night if I had to, and I got good grades. I got mostly A's and B's. Um, but the priority was, was, you know, sort of my career and like getting to know people and practicing my instrument and being prepared. And, um, I have no regrets about that because, it, it's made that transition very smooth. Um, you know, I did miss out on a lot of like the traditional college stuff. I didn't go to a single football game. I didn't um, go to that many parties or whatever, but I didn't care because I was having so much fun playing with, you know, some of my favorite musicians and, you know, um, that, you that was sort of how I did it. Yeah. Can you tell us where, I don't know how long ago this was, but like where some places, you know, post COVID when we're able to go out again um where are some places one might go in LA to hear like good where you might play or jazz musicians play in general where right yeah. and where did you play yeah yeah sure I mean uh so jazz is is sort of like what I studied in school and stuff and I, I love jazz and, and I would credit that to being um the music that shaped who I am as a musician but I play all kinds of music um mostly black American music um R&B hip-hop I do a lot of hip-hop and stuff like that um, and so I play it on a lot of places. Um, unfortunately, and this is really sad, um, sort of the house for artistic creative music, um, jazz world and, you know, all sorts of stuff uh, for the last 10 years has been the Blue Whale, which was in the heart of Little Tokyo in uh, downtown Los Angeles. And they unfortunately just shut down because of COVID. It's really sad. Um, and uh, before that, I was also playing 
at the Del Monte Speakeasy in Venice every Saturday night with my band, The Catalyst. Um, and uh, it looks like they're not doing so well either, um, which, you know, it's, it's a hard time. People and a lot of venues are having to shut down. The Jazz Gallery shut down in New York. Um, it's, it's a really tough time, especially for that type of music, because that type of music has always been struggling. Um, you know what I mean? Uh, but there's a lot of great venues in LA. Um, you know, I, I love playing at the Regent Theater. Um, I got to play the Hollywood Palladium a couple of times. That was really fun. Um, I mean, there's great music. You know, there's tons of venues, big and small. Um, where to see jazz? It's like, it's, it's, we'll have to see, you know? Uh, let's do this again when the pandemic is not a thing and maybe I'll have a better answer for you, but um, yeah. yeah. that makes sense. What um, are, have been some of your biggest highlights in your music career? Um, I have, I have a bunch. I mean, I've had a lot of fun over the last 10 plus years. Um, and there are, it's funny, there's two categories. Maybe sleep can attest to this, but uh, basically you have your highlights that um, sound like these really cool amazing things and then you have the things that you actually care about that you're like you know this is this was amazing for me and so it's like you know I mean this year I, I I'm nominated for three Grammys and like I won a Grammy for um my participation on Jay-Z's 444 record um for example and you know when people hear that like a trombone player that has like four Grammy nominations you know it sounds so cool you know what I mean but like to be honest like that Jay-Z session that I did I went in there and I played like three notes for all of 20 minutes and I got a check and then I had a Grammy, you know, a year later because of that. Um, so was that like a highlight for me? <laughs> like, no, it was cool. I love Jay-Z. You know, I'm happy to, I mean, I'm honored to be part of that record, but you know, some of my highlights were like going to France with my, my boy Phil, you know, for a week in uh, sophomore year and not sleeping at all and just playing every single night and like, eating raclette and like foie gras and you know what I mean mm -hmm. traveling anytime I get to travel with my friends that those are some of the highlights and uh you know I've been lucky to like you know you have a really old bio I should have totally sent you a more recent thing but you know <laughs> that's my bad Lynn I'm sorry um but yeah I've you know I've been able to travel a lot I've been to the Philippines like like you said um you know playing music in India um japan and that, that's the best like anytime you get to play music with your like best friends around the world and like eat food and like you know experience culture that to me is like the peak of life you know those are the best moments in life and i i'm fortunate enough to have tons of those tons of those highlights so that's that's been it for me that's great yeah. since we're running out of time i want to pick a question here um yeah that would be relevant to our teens out there. Do you have any, to, as a musician and to other budding musicians, do you have any tips for them? Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, it's a vague question. It's, it's a big, there's a lot, I have lots of tips. Um, I'd say the biggest thing is like, uh, and Sleep kind of mentioned this, but find, it, find a mentor, you know? Um, this is not a typical industry. This is not something where it's like you go to college and you do this major and then you, intern at this place and then you work your way up and then you do it it's like you can literally do anything in this in this industry and your your uh path your progression it's not going to be some like just steady uphill thing it's going to be ups and downs and all over the place there's going to be a lot of random things that happen and um you know you can kind of it's it's beautiful because it's very freeing in that you can make your own path but that also is a challenge right because you don't know exactly how things are going to go um, so find a mentor, like ideally find many mentors, you know, take lessons and, um, you know, ask questions, reach out to people you admire, um, have lots of influences, not just one person, but like look to lots of different people and, and try things out and be forgiving, be kind to yourself, you know, because this is not an easy thing to do. Um, but if you love it, it's worth it. So that's, that's what I would say. Along those lines, if you haven't already mentioned it, are there any, if you could tell your 17, 18 year old self something that you wish you had known then, what would that be? Um, probably the biggest thing I would tell myself at that age was like, it's okay to say no. Um, because, you know, I told you about my mindset when I went to LA, my mindset was, you know, get so, you know, well versed into the scene in LA that, 
you're working up full time by the time you graduate. And so my philosophy was say yes to everything, you know? And so that's what I did. I, you know, and it worked. Like I met a ton of different people. I played with some incredible people who have made huge names for themselves now. You know I mean? I used to play with Anderson Pack like every week, you know what I mean? For no audience um, back when he went by Breezy Lovejoy. Um, and lots of people like that. Uh, Moses was a classmate of mine, Moses Sumney, um, whatever. Um, but I also did a lot of things that like were horrible. Like they were not fun. They didn't pay anything. Um, you know, and I was mis like, there was a period of time in college where I was actually miserable. I was really, I was going through a hard time. Uh, not, not just career wise, but you know, like breakup and you know what I mean? Like we all have our hard times. Um, and I was miserable and I was questioning like whether career was even the right choice. Like music was the right career for me because, you know, I, I had, I was stuck on this philosophy that you have to say yes to everything because, um, you never know what, um, can lead to an opportunity. Um, and I've since learned that you absolutely can say no, uh, if things are not worth it. And, and not only can you, but you should, you know, because time is your most precious thing is not even money. It's time is your most valuable asset. And, uh, if, if people are, are not, you know, making your time worth it, you should not be giving away your time like that. You know, um, there are times where it's better to just do nothing at home and that's better for you than to agree to, you know, contribute to someone's project. That's not financially or emotionally worth it. You know what I mean? You have to, uh, so that's what I would have told my younger self. It's okay to say no. Yeah. Setting boundaries. That's really good advice. Setting for, boundaries. Yeah. So many different parts of our lives. And well, thank you. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Reassessing regularly. Reassessing. Well. Yes. Thank you so much, Jonah, for sharing that. I want us to leave a little time for questions and maybe Lynn, have you been monitoring the chat? I don't know if there are any questions in there, but I do know I had a question for sleep. What was that song that became a huge hit in New Zealand? Um, it was like a, a big collaboration song with, um, you know, the guys from Flight of the Concords? Yeah, so it was uh, Jermaine and forgive me, I forgot the other person's name, but it was, um, there's a thing called Red Nose Day. It's a charity for, um, for children uh, who have, uh, you know, disabilities or, you know, terminal, terminally ill children. And we did a thing where we interviewed a bunch of kids and said, like, what would you want to hear in the song? And so all the stuff that the kids said, we turned it into a song and all of the big artists from New Zealand all got on, uh, <laughs> on the song. And it's called, um, there's a funny title, it's called Feel Inside and Stuff Like That. So if you look up, if you look that up on YouTube, uh, <laughs> we, won, we won an award, it's called a TUI Award, which is like New Zealand's Grammys. We won, we won an award for it, but it's on YouTube and it's, it's like 10, 12 minutes long, but it's, it's great and it was for a great cause. So. Cool, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dylan asked, uh, Sleep, is that a launch pad behind you? That is a Ableton push, um, similar to a launch pad, but it's, uh, it's Ableton's, Ableton's version. Is there any like, is there any like BTS ARMY here watching, like hanging out? Yeah, any BTS ARMY here today? Yo, there's a couple. Uh, there you go. <laughs> it's flying. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what was your experience working like with BTS then? Can you share that with us? Great. Um, uh, the relationship started in 2016, I think. Uh, I met, um, I actually met RM way back then and the relationship didn't come from him, but that's when I first was starting to get familiar with their music. And um, they had a song uh, I forgot which one it was at the time, but uh, which one was it? Oh my gosh. Forgive me. I know it, but I can't think of it right now. But I fell in love with that song and then I just kind of just kept checking for them. And I was working with another label and um, the A&R from that label eventually went to Big Hit and we kept our relationship. Like I said, make those relationships with people and stay in touch and follow up with them. 
she reached out to me a few years later and said, hey, do you want to work on BTS? I was like, let me think about it. <laughs> of course, I want to work on BTS. <laughs> and uh, it was great. It was a lot of back and forth. Uh, I went to Korea a couple times as well. And um, yeah, it's it was great. It's, it's ongoing too. So it's been a, it's been a great experience. Like, um, that's awesome. Uh, we have a question here. Uh, it says, do you tailor ideas to artists or do you come up with ideas first and then find artists later for the song? I believe this question is for you, Sleeve. Oh, for me? Um, both. Uh, I'm, I'm constantly creating. Like, um, I think the best part is when I'm not working on something for somebody specific, I'm just coming up with what's going on in my head or, you know, a combination of my own influences. And uh, that's always fun because you know, a lot of times artists will gravitate towards that because if you're trying to do something that they might have already done, they might not necessarily want that. But um, Kendrick Lamar is like that. Like when I go play him music, he's like, let me hear your, let me hear your stuff. Where's your folder? Let me hear the stuff that you've been working on for yourself. Like he's very adamant about just always wanting to be different. So um, all of that, sometimes I'm tailoring stuff where people, I think that I, I, Jonah might be able to attest to this too. I think when you're making stuff for pitch, the goal is is always the biggest artist when you're making it. Like, oh, this would be great for Rihanna, but then you realize that there's a whole, you know, lane for that as well. So, um, you know, both of those. Mm. How about for you, Jonah? Do you tailor your ideas to artists, or do you come up with ideas first and then find artists later for the song that you create? Yeah, and I mean, most of the stuff I create, I do just, I guess, for myself and just what I hear. Um, I yeah, I feel like I'm not good at trying to imitate something that would, you know, be good for someone else. Um, yeah, I just, I'm not that good. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it's, it's something I need to work on, probably. But, um, but yeah, I, I usually just try to make stuff that I, that I hear and uh, hope that people that are interested in hiring me, you know, already like kind of my sound and stuff and, and want to do stuff together. I like collaborating with people too, like working on stuff for them. Um, and that's, that's more when I'm producing, but as a trombone player, absolutely. Like I have to, if I get called for something, I have to match what the artist wants or what the producer wants, okay. or whoever's in charge. Um, so I have much more experience doing that as a musician, less experience as a producer. Mm. Yeah. Great, great. Um, and then uh, this question from Kevin says, what's your home recording setup look like? So uh, maybe Sleek, you can show us what's behind you and then we'll, we'll jump to Jonah. Okay. Let me hope that this doesn't fall apart because my iPad stand is crazy. So right here, this is uh, this is called SSL6. It's like the center of my, it's like a mixing console, like the large mixing console you'll see in a studio, but for home have an Apollo, um, more SSL stuff. Uh, that is a DeepMind uh, synthesizer, analog synthesizer. And that's a little MIDI that I take with me everywhere. And uh, some plaques on the wall that is Black Eyed Peas. And yeah, that's it. I mean, it's, it's, I'm working off of a Mac mini, which is only like 1500 bucks. So you don't need like to have a ten thousand dollar computer to do what I do. Um, not saying that fifteen hundred bucks is just easily affordable, but you can do a lot with a little bit. <laughs> Sorry. All right, that's awesome. That is so awesome. Um, how about you, Jonah? What does your setup look like? <laughs> I, it's kind of hard for me to show, but that's um, okay. I'll just try it. <laughs> yeah. I have a couple mics. I, I recently, you know, I'm borrowing this uh, this mic. This is more of a vocal mic, and I have one that I use for trombone and stuff like that. A ton of instruments. Uh, this is I have a bunch of percussion over here, uh, all sorts of different stuff. My trombone right here. I have my keyboard, which is like a Yamaha. It's like one of those family keyboards, but I also use it as a MIDI controller. The, I got the Yamaha HS eights, I think the ones that are like this big. I also use an Apollo and I also use Ableton. I think it's the greatest program ever. I love it. Um, and yeah, just a ton of different weird instruments. I got a theremin most recently. Um, I have a melodica. Yeah, a bunch of weird stuff. <laughs> so, yeah. 
Cool, cool, that's awesome. Uh, Jessica, do you have a follow-up question from? Yeah, there were some questions here I saw from finding it. Okay, from Che or Chi, how do you deal, for, for both of you or either of you, how do you deal with creative drains or lack of inspiration? And um, Sleep addressed this a little bit, but especially during the pandemic, how do you keep that creative flow alive? Um, for me, I, I, I watch a lot of movies. Uh, I get like a lot of inspiration from like, I've written so many songs that were like based off the dynamic between two characters in a TV show or a movie. Like, uh, I think that there's there's stories in everything if, you, if you're paying attention. Um, yeah, just doing that. I think that your downtime is just as important as your go time. You know, like, I don't think that you have to just, you don't have to drain yourself and be on E constantly. Like, that's that's a lie. Like, you know, you see different producers and it's like, you know, team no sleep. And, you know, I hate that name. I hate that. Know. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like a personal attack on me. So I don't like it anyways. You know, I, I go to sleep. Like, I, I definitely get my rest. Um, but I have those, you know, I have those, those, those moments. Like I, I, like right now, like I'm working hard and, you know, I'm still getting my rest, but I'm working hard, but then I chill just as hard as well too. I will go on a vacation so quick. Like I'm not going to just sit around and kill myself to just be in the studio. So, um, and, and like music is coming to you as life is happening. Like you have to let life happen. Like I can't just write, 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 write for everybody and not take care of, of myself. So the way I get around uh, like those blocks, those creative blocks, I just allow them. I allow them to happen. Um, I do think that there's a certain amount of inspiration that just comes when you sit down and just start doing your work. Like when you just start, like you might have a block, but if you just start playing some chords, whatever, like it'll come. But then you gotta also know when you're having that to just allow it, do something else. Like I have, cameras like I do a lot of photography like I said I cook like that just do other stuff because it's all related it's all related it's all coming from like the same like source of creativity so um I just allow them and then when it's time to get back to work I just kind of just get back to it so that's great what about you Jonah yeah I, I agree 100% with everything sleep said um I think engaging in other creative outlets uh, that are away from your profession is really helpful. Uh, it's fun, it's exciting, and it actually can help you get inspired again. Um, so I like sleep, I, I, lo I love to cook too. Um, my most recent hobby is skateboarding. I've, I've been doing that a lot. Um, and, but I have a Nintendo Switch here too. Like I, I play, you know, Smash Bros and stuff. Um, you gotta have fun uh, in addition to work really hard. Uh, and then one other thing I'll say is, um, uh, when it comes to um, working on stuff, um, there are going to be days where you are just super drained and you're or just, you know, you're feeling down and you're not feeling inspired. Uh, the days that you're inspired, you don't have to worry about. But on those days uh, when you need to work anyways, um, one thing that I do, uh, which I really recommend is it's called the Pomodoro technique. And it's basically you just set a timer for 25 minutes and you just focus on whatever task it is. And so if, that, if, if that's like making a beat from scratch or something, just hit the timer, turn your phone off and just, just force yourself to get started on something for just 25 minutes. It's just not going to kill you. And a lot of times you'll see that like 10 minutes into it, you're like, Oh, I'm feeling this. And then all of a sudden you have some inspiration. So um, if you wait around for inspiration, it might not come, but if you just force yourself to start something, it, you might actually make it come. So. Thank you. Um, there was a question also from Olivia. Uh, she asking, I think for teens, do you have any advice on how to reach out to artists as a producer without a team to help? And Olivia, feel free to clarify this question if I didn't interpret it correct correctly. So I think she wants to know like how to, without connections or anything, how do you advise just kind of getting yourself out there? Um, I think like, right now especially like you know in this climate you know a lot of people are at home and there's been so many people that have reached out to me uh just deeming me on instagram and asking me to if they can interview me like there were two berkeley students that asked if they can interview me for um some kind of class like their final they had to reach out to someone in the music business and i think that people are a lot easier to get in touch with than 
not like I mean you can't DM Beyonce but you know you can DM me and ask questions you know like you know like I said there's plenty of levels of people that are like in the music business to reach out to and like I think that producers instrument players um songwriters are a lot easier to reach than you know say huge artists and, and um yeah I would say just just reach out like you know you exhaust every avenue that you have and you'll get something from somewhere that will give you motivation to keep on doing right. it. something will come from you know if you reach out respectfully to 50 producers I mean you're going to get 20 people are going to message you back and at least try to be helpful in some capacity which also, I mean, it means to doing some homework first, knowing who you're finding out who those people are and then reaching out to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And just, you know, if, if, if the approach is, is appropriate, which is, it's simple, you know, hello, how are you doing? My name is, I would like to ask you about this because I aspire to do this one day. If I see that, I'm always going to answer that, you know, like there's no way that I'm just going to just like I couldn't open that and just be like, ah, I hate kids. Ah, like, oh, well, you know, like I'm gonna answer that question, you know. So, um, you know, social media is, is 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 your friend. It's all fun and games, and it's fun to get on there and laugh and crack jokes and look at memes. But it's also a super powerful tool to help you um, get in touch with people. I got in touch with people that I ended up working with on MySpace. You know, <laughs> like that I ended up having long term uh, friendships with, like. Uh, uh, me and Nipsey Hussle actually met on MySpace and we ended up going to New York together and working together and, and back in 2009 or so like that. So social media is, is way more powerful now than it was in 2006, 2007. So yeah, utilize that. It's, it's there for you. Thank you. And Jonah, do you have anything to add to that? No, I mean, that that was the answer. You know, <clears throat> people... Um... <laughs> And like you said, you know, be respectful, um, and also don't don't expect to hear back from some anyone just because you reached out. You know, some people won't get back to you, and that's okay. Like, you know, just you know, be okay with that. Like, but still, give it a shot. You know, you have nothing to lose. So. Thank you. Nothing to lose. Yeah. Nothing to lose. Okay, so our it's already past five, so we'll have our answer. One last question from Philip. Um, do. You, does any kind of spiritual activity feed your day-to-day -day rhythm? Um, like, yeah, I'm big on meditation. I kind of like start my mornings off like that. And then uh, I don't know why I started doing this, but I like kind of lay on the floor and put my legs up, like try to get as upside down as possible to let the blood flow the other way, you know? I, I started my, started starting my days like that. And I swear, like I feel so much better. And then, uh, yeah, just kind of just taking a, a, a few minutes to myself when I first wake up, because every day when I wake up, I mean, it's like 100 messages between texts and emails and things like that. And so I try to like not get into things that other people want me to do until noon. You know, like I try to take the 8 a.m. to noon time for myself to like kind of like visualize how I see my day going and how, you know, I want to, to bring my goals closer as well, so. Yeah. Yeah, I would say the same thing. Meditation has been <clears throat> my uh, my greatest um, activity, you know, to help keep me centered. Um, it's something I've been doing every day um, for years now. I don't, I don't do it every day. There are days I miss, but um, I can usually tell when I haven't meditated. Um, it's that by far is something I recommend to everyone. Um, and, uh, I was gonna say something else, but I totally forgot. So, <laughs> oh, journaling too. I, I journal a lot. I started doing that a few years ago. There's a great book called The Artist's Way, and one of the main uh, points of that book is she, she recommends uh, journaling. Just you know, in the morning, doing your morning pages, writing three pages free form, and uh, I started doing that a few years ago, and that really helped me. It just kind of, I don't know, kind of wakes you up and just gets everything off out of your head all your weird dreams and stresses gets it out on the paper and then you can start your day fresh so um, that's another thing that really helped me thanks you guys it's been wonderful today having you both speak and lynn is there anything else you wanted to add yeah do we miss, do we miss any questions i feel bad if we miss some questions because yeah. it's five o'clock yeah i'm not in a rush if we have like another five or, minutes like i'm okay, okay. with that 
Okay. Yeah, I don't mind staying a if, little more. Do you, do you guys have, um, if our teams or our audience members want to reach out to you or, you know, listen to your music, what's the best way uh, to contact you and where can they find your music? Yeah. Well, I'll um, go ahead and plug your, your links to Oh yeah, yeah. I'll start. Um, I'll I'll put this in the chat. Um, my Instagram, well, all my social media is at Funky Lips Levine. Kind of silly, but that's what it is. And uh, my email, you can just email me if you have questions or if anyone wants to, for any reason, take lessons or whatever. I do that. Um, my email is Jonah Levine uh, Music at Gmail dot com. I'll put that also in the chat. He's wonderful. You guys can follow Jonah on Instagram and check out his uh, amazing pictures and music. They, awesome. All right. How about you, Sleep? Um, yeah. If you want to reach out, you can just uh, reach out at hits, hitsleep at gmail.com. That's my email address. H I T sleep, hitsleep at gmail.com. And uh, I don't have uh, a lot of projects out, my own personal projects out on Spotify and things like that. What I do is mostly producing for other people. So um, just make sure you stream uh, the Map of the Soul 7 album because it's my favorite album and stream my time if you want to have clear skin because that is the, the regimen that you should follow. <laughs> All right. Yes, we got some fans here. <laughs> <laughs> I love them. They're, they're the best. Yeah. Oh, so many, uh, so many appreciative audience members here. Um, everyone's saying thank you so much for taking the time to talk today. Um, How many producers do we have? Like aspiring producers, do we have? Yeah. Are there any producers here? You guys can. Oh, we got a couple. Wow, awesome. actually there's a lot. <laughs> so if you are, if you want to, um, if you're aspiring to be a producer and you have like your own setup, then email me and I want to gift you guys a, a, a splice of subscription. It's a, it's a place where you can download sounds and things like that. So I'll, I'll get you guys some, um, some splice subscriptions to splice.com so you can download some sounds, get some high quality sounds. Wow. We'll get that set up. We'll get that done before, the, like, we'll get that done this weekend. Like, I'll set you guys up on Sunday. Oh, this is so wonderful. They're, they're just so excited. <laughs> All right. Wow. That's so wonderful, Sleek. Thank you so much for <laughs> hooking them up. Uh, they're no just problem. so grateful. Yeah. Yeah, thank you both so much for sharing your experience and your story of, you know, with our community today. Uh, I'm sure there's many people out there that ha are so inspired by you both and they're getting ready to, to get to work. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you for sharing your advice. Skills, and your experience. skills pay the bills, kids. Skills pay oh, the bills. Skills Focus pay the on bills. Your skills. Get good at what you do. And, and focus on that. Like, if you're very skillful, like, you'll always be able to find some kind of work. Amazing advice. All right. Um, well, you guys, everybody here, you guys have all of um, Sleep, Sleep and Jonah's contact information, their Instagram uh, or their emails. Definitely hit them up. They are so nice and so open. And I just, I just love everything that they shared with all of us today. So I'm hoping that, um, you know, we can invite them to come back in the near future, uh, maybe post pandemic, and then they can talk more about their uh, new and upcoming projects that they have going on. So um, yeah, Jessica, anything else? No? I right. think that's it. Um, we're having yeah. another career day next Wednesday at four o'clock and for the rest of this month. So Lynn will be sending out information about that. If you didn't already join um, the career day list, you'll have another opportunity to. So fill out that survey and we'll include you on the upcoming events. Yep, thank you. And I did link the survey in the chat. So please take a moment to fill that out. If there's anything that you know surprised you, 
or, or that you loved from today's session, please uh, input that in the survey and we'll share that with Sleep and Jonah. All right, everyone says incredible work. And then um, wow. next week we have uh, my friends from the Bay Area. Um, I have a photographer, a wedding photographer and a florist. She does a lot of amazing events um, for people um, all over the all over the country, uh, really. So um, they are both small businesses, women in small businesses, and they're going to come and share, um, you know, their life story and their careers with all of you. So hopefully we see you guys next week. I'll send you guys the email. Again, thank you everybody for being here today. Thank you, Sleep. Thank you, Jonah. You guys are amazing. Thank you. Yeah.